Hello and welcome to Year in Review, a chance to look back at 2019's biggest news stories. Well, joining me are the editor of the Times Literary Supplement, Stig Abel, the Telegraph's associate editor, Camilla Tomini, the Sun's political editor, Tom Newton Dunn, and the editor of The Londoner at the Evening Standard, Aisha Hazarika. So welcome to all of you. Thank you very Hello. much. Now, when we first sat down to make this programme, we asked all of our guests here to choose their story of the year, and their decision was unanimous. It was, of course, the Brexit election. Mm. So we're going to get to that in a <laughs> moment, but uh, through the course of the hour, we're also going to be looking at the big stories from outside Westminster, our panel's heroes and villains of the year, as well as their predictions for 2020. But before all of that, let's go back to Brexit and the election. And Tom, I'm going to kick off with you. A huge year uh, politically. What do you see as the most important facet of this huge story? Well, th there was only Brexit, really, in British politics this year. Uh, it began with it and it's ending with it. Uh, and for me, the absolutely central figure in all of this was Boris Johnson. And therefore, the story of the year has to be Boris Johnson election as Tory leader, winning the Tory leadership contest, because really everything else flowed from that. Uh, he won the contest by promising he would get Brexit through no matter what on time. It didn't quite happen like that, but with that very sort of strong, powerful measure, that's what got him elected. That's what also then allowed him to tee up this great Parliament versus the people struggle, which allowed him to force a general election, which became a very popular mantra during the election, as we know. He won it with a landslide. But the, the one really interesting thing about the, the rise and rise and rise of Boris Johnson is it really wasn't predestined at all. A series of different sliding door events, things that what ifs, things didn't happen. Theresa May not winning three different meaningful votes, 20 Labour MPs going a, a different way, 10 DUP MPs, etc., etc. All these sort of series of chaotic happenings all precipitated in Boris's victory. And Aisha, as a former Labour advisor, you may not naturally be a big fan of Boris Johnson, but would you acknowledge <laughs> that this has been an extraordinary achievement by him to, to, to pull off what he has this year? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the result was far bigger than, than anybody um, you know, predicted. And lots of us were hoping for a hung parliament. We were thinking maybe a majority of around 20, but that was a huge landslide. I do have to say one thing, though. I mean, everybody is saying, yes, he's a formidable campaigner and he ran a great campaign. He was also up against the most repellent person on the doorstep, which was Jeremy Corbyn. And I think that they had a, an electoral advantage by being up against somebody who was just polling so badly and was turning people off in their droves. So, in a way, yes, Boris Johnson won, but I think Jeremy Corbyn helped him a lot. OK, and we're going to come back to, to Labour and, and how they fared this year in, in a moment. But, Camilla, let's uh, move on to you, because I know that your uh, pick of this uh, Brexit election issue has been uh, the, the moment that you believe that those uh, pieces of the puzzle started falling into place for Boris Johnson. Well, I think it was when he secured the Brexit deal against all odds. And Tom then was talking about the leadership campaign, which seems like about 50 years ago now. But I remember going around um, some of the hustings, particularly up in the north, and the weight of expectation on this politician was huge. People were saying that they were supporting him in the leadership because he would, quote, get Brexit done. And it's no wonder that that carried on being the campaign slogan. But it really was this idea that if he wasn't going to deliver, then politically he would be finished. It was such a high-risk, high-reward strategy, really, that he took in order to say that he would die in a ditch and that this would be his lasting legacy. And when he went out to Brussels, it's hard to remember now because so much has happened since, but you had politicians like Rory Stewart calling this, U this Brexit deal a unicorn. It was never going to happen. In fact, <coughs> the entire premise of the re rebel uh, Tory rebellion, um, the, the remain a Tory rebellion was this idea that he didn't want a deal and that he wasn't going to get one and this was all a strategy to keep no deal on the table and in fact when he came back from Brussels with something which okay people said looked a bit like Theresa May's deal in a blonde wig but at the same time managed to remove the backstop I thought that was quite a seminal moment in finally this politician who had been underestimated countless times actually delivering on something. But he delivered it by doing something he said he wouldn't do, which also characterises Boris Johnson, that he has a tremendous amount of front, and you need that a lot in politics. You, he, he says stuff and people believe him, but he said he wouldn't create a border down the middle of the Irish Sea, and that's precisely what he conceded. He recognises that getting a deal, this may well happen actually next year as well, getting a deal, being able to say you've got a deal, is more important than the detail 
of it, uh, it, itself. And, and, you know, eventually that may come back to haunt him, it may come back to haunt the, haunt the Tory party, it may haunt all of us collectively in this country. But he recognised pragmatically that the most important thing was getting a deal that he could stand behind, even though it did the thing he said it didn't, it wasn't going to do. Having said that, I think you could say from his perspective that he was at the point of negotiations where he was and Tom talked earlier about sliding doors and had Gove not knifed him in the back during the original leadership campaign then who knows whether it would have been different whether the negotiation would have been carried out differently but what I think that getting that deal said and I appreciate what you're saying about its flaws which will no doubt come unraveled in the coming months was this idea that he did not want to be responsible for a failure of statescraft because people had said he can't do the detail and he isn't a statesman and look at him as foreign secretary and I think in emerging from Brussels triumphant even though it may be a Pyrrhic victory was hugely significant in the path that then led to his landslide election and, victory. And a quick word about um, Theresa May as well I mean if it's been a good year for Boris Johnson it's been her annus horribilis hasn't it? Well I think that would be the view from a slightly sort of short term Perspective. Actually, I think history might write it just a little bit differently. Remember, she got really close to getting this deal over the line. She lost the last, last minute vote by 58 votes. That actually only means 30, 29 MPs voting the other way in a country. And that's in a parliament of 650. That's quite small. So she got most of the deal done, couldn't get it quite over the line. Boris's showmanship, right place, right time, did get it over the line. But then also, you know, go forward to the general election. All those seats the Tories won, most of them were down to tiny Labour majorities. The reason why they're down to tiny Labour majorities, a few hundred here, a few hundred there, is because Theresa May took huge chunks out of them in 2017. So she sort of did the hard work, you could argue, and Boris sweeps in to take the glory at the end. And she's better suited to her role, isn't she? I mean, she, the, the great thing about Theresa May was she was not suited to be Prime Minister, mm. because many of the qualities that people who like Boris Johnson see in him, she simply doesn't have. And Ayesha, we'll come to your pick of this big story, and you're choosing to focus on uh, the party that's close to your heart, on, on Labour and how they uh, dealt with things. Was Brexit their undoing, do you think? I think there was a number of things. I think the fact that the, on the biggest issue of the day, the, you know, the political fight which has defined a generation in many ways, they were facing in two different directions. They were trying to be all things to all people and they pleased nobody in the end. We hemorrhaged a lot of Remain supporters and we also lost a lot of Leave supporters. And I think the fatal mistake was that the party tried to push the argument that this was not going to be a Brexit election when everybody knew it was going to be a Brexit election and to go in with a neutral position. So the question that really sort of skewered Jeremy Corbyn again and again during the debates and all the interviews, he couldn't answer the question. So if there's going to be a second referendum that you are now pushing for, how are you going to campaign and how are you going to vote? He could not answer that question. But, but how important was that given that he did try to keep Remainers and Leavers, uh, his voters were so split, did he not have I think the a problem was that he issue? left it too late. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is actually a man who has shown himself to be capable of leadership on quite contentious issues. Take the issue of economic austerity. When he first became leader of the Labour Party, the dominant narrative was that we did need austerity. <coughs> he changed that by showing leadership. He didn't show leadership on the Brexit issue. Partly a lot of people think because he was divided himself. He was well known as a historic Brexiteer, often voting in the lobbies with a lot of the, the arch, you know, ERG um, members. But it wasn't just Brexit. We have to be honest about the fact there were two other issues. Uh, the manifesto was popular to many because there was just so much in it. It was a bonanza giveaway. It was a wish list. It was Black Friday of, of political policies. And people just didn't believe it. It became incredible in the literal sense of the word and, and anybody who knows like Labour history is Labour governments that are, are, are opposition who are trying to get into government have to look like they're credible on the economy and the final thing was that he was toxic on the on the doorstep his personal ratings were absolutely you know through the floor and um, from issues like national security was he a patriot his links with terrorism anti-semitism I can't quite understand this is that in 2017 that was all true yeah. that's but people the didn't question. think he had a chance of winning whereas I think because the polling yeah. towards the end did suggest I spoke to a cabbie this week which I know sounds like a cliche mm. and he said well I saw the polling and I saw how close Corbyn got and I went out to the polling station a quarter to ten because I thought my mm. vote really counts yeah. I don't think there was that degree of peril in 2017
OK, and the other uh, area that we haven't touched on is your pick, uh, Stig, and the that Lib is... The Lib Dems. <clears throat> Lib Dems. The thing about the Lib Dems I think find fascinating, from 2016 onwards, you'd have to imagine there'd be a moment for the Lib Dems. The 48% Labour's position, as we know, veered between being yes to Brexit to we're not really sure to maybe. The Tories were fairly quickly on to the yes with the party of Brexit. So there should have been a party for the 48%. And there wasn't in the years immediately after Brexit. Then the European elections happened and the Lib Dems did quite well. And the idea, had the stain of coalition been washed off them? Were people willing to forgive and vote Lib Dem? And therefore everyone got a bit excited. Jo Swinson got excited. A couple of polls put her near 20% of the vote. Maybe they would become a major third party again. And then it just fell apart. What was the mistake? Was it the policy of revoking Article 50? I think that contrary to what some Brexiteers would say, people, a lot of people who voted Remain do believe in democracy. And the problem with the Lib Dem position was the idea of revoking out of hand, which uh, intellectually, same with Corbyn's position, intellectually you can kind of justify it because they wanted something clean, they wanted something that was absolutely straightforward. But in doing so, there's a bunch of people who thought, well, we had this, this referendum. I didn't agree with it. I didn't agree with the result. You, but you cannot simply remove it from history. And, and also, two incredible leaders, as in uncredible leaders, you know, Tim Farron, followed by Joe Swinson. Who neither lost her seat, of course, we should Who then I went to lose everyone. her own seat. But, but neither of them really cut through. Joe Swinson's a bit wooden, but maybe a bit sort of young and experienced. Tim Farron, quite frankly, annoyed a lot of people, had some quite questionable views on... on illiberal. On, uh, illiberal views mm -hmm. on, on gay rights. Uh, and they just simply failed to cut through. But, you know, what really triumphed, it wasn't the Lib Dems what lost it, it was the two-party system what won it. Yet again, the two-party system, that binary choice that defines everything in British politics for the last 300 years, has come back. But I okay. also think one of Very the quick. other things that um, Joe Swinson made a fatal mistake, they were too, they overclaimed too much. I mean, it just was not believable. She was like, I'm going to be the next prime minister. I'm going to win a majority. It's like, that is, I'm, there's more chance of me winning America's next top model, to be honest, than... And she than, was than, than, really than, I know, exactly. Yeah, she was so nice. Curiously as well, despite her kind of right-on approach, she was very much tainted by the fact that she had been apparently complicit in the austerity introduced Absolutely. by the coalition government. And I don't think she expected to be quite so damaged about okay. it. OK, yeah, well, we must move on to other subjects. Uh, do stay with us, because coming up, we're going to have some of the other big stories of the year picked over, including a prince under fire, a presidency under scrutiny, and a planet under threat. That's coming up after the break. Welcome back. You're watching Year in Review here on Sky News. Now time to step out of the Westminster bubble and look at some of the other big stories of the year. And uh, Camilla, we're going to start with you because outside of politics, your beat for a long time has been the royals and it's been a big year for them and not always for the right reasons. That's right. It was a double whammy really when all of the allegations concerning the Duke of York's links to convicted paedophile Jeffrey Epstein came to the surface and that happened for two reasons I think first of all following Epstein's suicide in prison which then engendered another raking over of all of the allegations more people coming forward to suggest that he had be behaved uh, improperly but equally this enormous act of self-sabotage in Prince Andrew doing the Newsnight interview oh, yeah. now that weekend which came in the middle of political melee anyway meant that my workload was doubled and I didn't go home for about 12 days. Is that why you've picked it? You're... That's why I've picked it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. out of resentment for the issue. The but no, story of the year. Uh, it was a very interesting story how that unfolded because we first of all got wind of the Newsnight interview and then of course you're waiting for the first quotes to drop just to see what it is and anyone that's had any dealings with the Duke of York did scratch their heads and wonder whether it would be a good idea to put him up for an hour of television being grilled by Emily Maitlis um, and when the tapes then dropped and we saw what he said we all concluded that we were right to have perhaps thought and, it was a it bad wasn't idea. just what he said, it's what he didn't say as well. Well, it, it wasn't just what he said. I mean, and some of the takeaways from it, you know, that he couldn't have been at Tramp's nightclub because he was at a Pizza Express in wo Woking. Not sweating. And that he couldn't sweat <laughs> and that he was sure he hadn't <coughs> had sex with Virginia Roberts. Jeffrey Epstein's accuser because that is a physical act that he would remember and when he was asked whether he would express regret over the friendship and let's not forget that he did spend four days at Epstein's house post conviction apparently breaking off the friendship um, he basically said that no because he thought he had done the honourable thing in standing by a friend and equally Epstein was very useful because he had great connections so it wasn't just the interview itself where we saw 
a royal discombobulate on screen, but then the subsequent fallout. And f to go from a situation where he had apparently told his mother at church on Sunday that it had gone well and that it would draw a line to four days later him releasing a statement saying that he was stepping back from public duty for the foreseeable future sort of was a little bit of a moment like the aftermath of Princess Diana's death where we were all questioning the monarchy and there were political ramifications because if you remember in one of the TV debates both Johnson and Corbyn were asked whether the public should still have trust in the monarchy or what could what could be done with the monarchy and Corbyn said well it might be in need of improvement so Do you know and, what? And for me it was a really funny story because this thing has been around for what 10 years now yes. the Jeffrey Epstein scam has been running for, for an awful long time so so why not because and I think it's because right up to this moment it's been he says versus she says and actually no one really knew the truth of the allegations then you hear heard him as Camilla said for an entire hour and you heard he says and immediately everyone thought, actually, do you know what? It's she Except says. He's, he's, he's categorically denied we any wrongdoing. We should all say all legal reasons. Well, we do, yeah, absolutely. We do. But I think of th my takeaway of, of it was that, you know, two years after the Me Too movement, to have a situation where, yet again, you know, uh, a, a, very, a, a man in a huge amount of power and privilege is showing no empathy for not just this victim, but any of the victims. <coughs> He showed no kind of understanding about what these young, and they were girls, At the hands of Jeffrey Epstein, had, had, had gone through. And I just thought, you know, and I think quite a lot of people, it was like, wow, you know, what a damning indictment on those kind of people and those circles. And to just be so sort of tone okay. deaf was quite stunning. I'm going to move us on because we've got a lot of different stories to get, get on okay. to. We're coming to you, Stig, okay. next. And you're talking about the rise of climate change up the I'm agenda, only talk, political or otherwise. I'm only talking about the future survival of our species on the planet, so it's not as important as, uh, as everything else. And that, to me, is the striking news story of the year. Uh, what is, should be a relatively straightforward story, there is a problem with climate change, there is a problem with our ability to, to take steps to deal with it, is politicised. It's part of the great culture war uh, that we see in every other respect. And if you paused for a moment to back away from that, that is kind of crazy that there is something that is a, um, it's an existential peril to everybody, maybe not now, but in future generations, it's something that needs to be fixed. The science has been known for several years. You know, a book came out this year that talked about how at the end of the 1970s, almost every fact that we now cling to about climate change was known. George Bush famously, famously said, don't worry about the greenhouse effects, I've got the White House effect, and then did nothing. And yet it gets mired in politicisation in culture wars in this question of whether Greta Thunberg is a good thing or a bad thing. She was named the Time magazine person of the year. Extinction Rebellion, who, who while having some noble views, tend to, to succumb to every single stereotype that people want to have about those who care about the environment. So people like Boris Johnson can dismiss them aesthetically as crusties rather than engaging with the issues. Everything about this story is crazy. It's a crazy thing that it's now 2019 and we are still not engaging with the central question of our age. And I do feel that when we look back and we talk about the things that have been spoken about, it will be frightening and astonishing that collectively this has been able to be a, a politicised part of the culture war. Camilla, do you think that's right? And we've heard a lot about Extinction Rebellion who have disrupted Londoners. Uh, some people have criticised their methods, but do, but do you welcome the impact they've had? Had they had an impact? Well, I think... Blue Planet had a major impact on people's behaviour from a consumer point of view. And I think some people in the UK kind of look on with a sense of bewilderment because they feel they're doing their bit. They feel that they're trying to recycle and act responsibly and take a reusable coffee cup and not take as many flights. And so they sort of look at Extinction Rebellion getting in the way of their daily commute and wonder whether they aren't better placed protesting outside the Chinese or Indian embassies, to be perfectly honest. But I think the other thing that the cult culture was the sort of generational culture war on this, and I think it's been fascinating about how many old men have got so upset about Greta Thunberg, like to the point where they're apoplectic with rage because, you know, she has got this huge global conversation going. And I think one of the things, because this election was so dominated by Brexit, it was actually a shame that climate change did not get more of a hearing because I think for a lot of particular younger people not just younger people this is a really huge pressing concern and it is slowly moving up the priority list that people do care about okay I'm gonna be very bossy and move us on uh, very quickly because we've got a
couple more stories to talk about, both focusing on America. And, and Tom, you've picked out uh, Donald Trump as your non-Westminster uh, story. And at the time of recording, he looks almost certain to be impeached, which is yeah. extraordinary. He, he, he is going to be impeached. This is the, the man formerly known as the leader of the free world. Uh, for only the third time in American history, in 300 years of, of American history, uh, they are trying to sack their president. And for me, it is an absolutely extraordinary story that, that really has been passed over, I think, a bit here, because Donald Trump is, uh, has some pretty um, colourful opinions about him, and you kind of expect him to be impeached at some stage in his presidency. But this story will, I think, dictate the outcome not just of his current presidency, but also the outcome of the 2020 US presidential election. If the Democrats succeed in impeaching him and try him and convict him in the Senate, where they don't have a majority, uh, then obviously he will no longer be the president and <coughs> his successor will obviously find it very hard to win that president's election. So we'll have a Democrat in the White House for the next four years. If, however, they fail, I suspect that the rebound against the Democrats that he will be able to use for them tying up, you know, Washington time and effort and bureaucracy and shouting and screaming about essentially a political matter that isn't really going to affect people's ordinary lives, that will give him a big enough bounce to win four more years. So it's, it will have seismic ramifications. Do you think that's right? You know, whatever the outcome, it's going to have a big impact on the election? Well, I think, of course, it will, because it either finishes his political career or it emboldens him to e be even more sledgehammer-like when it comes to his approach to American politics. But I think because the Senate is weighted in his favour, this seems like a bit of a process, and, and it seems to be a foregone conclusion that the Senate will back him, the Republican-backed mm. Senate will back him. So then it looks like it's a bit of a sideshow, or that it's basically... Uh, the Democrats attempt once again to mm. basically thwart a president that they've never supported and they've tried to use perhaps legitimately every trick in the book to get rid of. It's not going to convince anyone new. You can, you, the people in America you will fear will have formed their opinions on this. Because again, at one level, an American president being accused of being in the pocket of a foreign government should, in theory, in America, be end of the game. It's the worst thing you can ever say about a president of America, you know, being in, in hock to Russia. Remember the charges. The charges are not that he was cooperating with the Russians, it, that he was withholding 400 million US dollars in military aid from the new Ukrainian president, uh, Vladimir Lezensky, which I used to practice and finally got it right. Well done. Uh, Pretty well close. Which is <laughs> yeah, a phenomenally... Yeah, I think we need to all act it's a phenomenally <laughs> enormous bribe. He's using taxpayers' money to bribe a foreign he leader he to try and uh, go after his political opponent, he Joe Biden's son. It was a perfect phone call. There was no quid pro quo and no proof. And the, that it's a bizarrely, the facts aren't in dispute. That's the strangest My thing about the whole story. My favourite of that story is when because they, they really hate Joe Biden and his son. And Ivanka Trump sort of did a tweet saying it's unbelievable that Joe Biden's son got a job and he had no qualifications. <laughs> no kind of you were like, whoa, that is amazing. Yeah. And Aisha, we're going to stick with you actually because you've picked out an element of Donald Trump's year as well, haven't you? So you know, Donald Trump. Many of us have felt for a long time has peddled a lot of xenophobia, bigotry, Islam. Islamophobia, racism, and that all crystallized this year when he told three, or actually four minority Democrat congresswomen known as the Squad um, to go back home to their broken and crime infested places. And I think that was quite a watershed moment because it did show that without any doubt, the true character of this person, the fact that, you know, to say to people, by the way, they were all born in the United States of America. They're all American citizens. But that was like a reveal into his mentality, which is if you don't look like me, then you're not <coughs> really American and that you should go home. And any person of colour to be told to go home is one of the most offensive things possible, particularly when they're born in that country. Well, that's right. Three out of the four born in the country, all four American citizens. Uh, we are going to wrap it up of this section of, for the time being, but uh, plenty more still to come, so do stay with us. Uh, celebration and scorn as the team pick their heroes and villains of the year coming up after the break. Welcome back. This is Year in Review on Sky News. Uh, we're discussing the highs and lows of 2019 with the editor of the Times Literary Supplement, Stig Abel, the Telegraph's associate editor, Camilla Tomini, the Sun's political editor, Tom Newton Dunn, and the editor of The Londoner at the Evening Standard, Ayesha Hazarika. So welcome back to all of you. So let's turn our attention now to the stories that made our guests cheer and jeer. It's their heroes and villains of 2019. Uh, Stig, I'm going to come to you first. Okay. Uh, your hero is? Dominic Cummings. And your villain is? Dominic Cummings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Explain. Uh, well, I mean, he's not my hero in the sense of... Uh, he's not someone whose uh, who's philosophy or indeed the consequence of his philosophy I massively applaud, but I think you have to 
accepts that he was the dominant figure, one of the dominant figures that has led from the outer chaos that began the year in terms of what was going to happen to Brexit. We looked like we were stuck into, into horrible stasis to where we are now, which is we're pursuing Brexit with clear vigour and clear direction. So anyone who supports Brexit, Dominic Cummings, is unquestionably a hero. Anyone who admires middle-aged men who dress scruffily... <laughs> I see. Right. This is your ulterior motive. It's uh, yes. yes. Britain's dress sense. I kind of do. Yeah, exactly. So he, he, he dresses like he's, uh, he's, he's sort of almost a hipster, but isn't quite. He sort of has just fallen out of bed at four in the morning. I admire that for, for reasons that won't need any further explanation. So he's a hero in that respect. The villainous side is that he seems to me to epitomise a certain type of politics in this country that very, very um, end oriented, which says we don't care what we break in order to get what we want. And you saw it with the Vote Leave campaign. He famously had say three things, whatever the question is, say the same three things. It does not matter if they are true or not. We are repeatedly going to say them because then people will hear what we're saying. And the same thing, he was perfectly willing to crash Parliament, perfectly willing to crash all sorts of institutions. Now, people may say they are there to be crashed, they are there to be subverted, but he is purely driven, goal-driven, and if you don't share those goals, he will appear to be an utter villain. It's right. A quick word from you, Tom. Do you think that's fair criticism for starters? And how much credit can he take for the achievements that, of Boris Johnson this year? I, I think that's both fair credit and fair criticism, actually. I wouldn't quite agree with um, Sig's uh, very own sort of dress sense and neither Dominic Cummings. I think you can wear a shirt when you do press reviews as well as going to yeah. Downing Street on Tom a daily basis. Tom took his tie off before he started doing this. Yeah, that's true. Did do that, you have been exposed. Yeah. <laughs> Tells other school you yeah. to be careful. He's actually wearing shorts um, yeah. as well. Are you sure? I also took our ties off. Yeah, I'm not going to my father Christmas socks, but it's another matter. Uh, but without a doubt, he is the central figure, along with Boris Johnson, of the political year. He, he's set the weather, he's behind pretty much every single political news story we've had, and, you know, like him or loathe him, and there's good reasons for both, you've got to give it to him. OK, Ayesha, I'm going to move to you. Uh, your hero. So this was a Muslim lady who was on a tube train and she stood up to a man who was hurling very vicious, horrible, quite frightening anti-Semitic abuse at a Jewish man and his children. And the, the, the person who was making the abuse was actually quite frightening but she stood up to him and I think it was just a moment of real courage. And anti-Semitism has been a growing problem in the last couple of years. We're seeing it in wider society. We've actually seen it in the Labour Party. It's been a huge issue driven out some very, very important MPs like Luciana Berger. And what I loved about this story is often um, Muslims and Jews are being pit against each other. So it was fantastic to see sort of this woman stand up for somebody. And it's not just anti-Semitism. We're seeing the rise of Islamophobia as well. We've got a lot of that in the Conservative Party at the moment. And I just felt in a, in a year of a lot of division, of a lot of kind of hatred and, and communities sort of fighting with each other, it was great to see sort of two people from two different communities kind of coming together to look after each other. And your villain is on the same theme. Yeah, I think one of the things that has polluted politics has been the rise of, not the rise, but just the proliferation of online trolling. Now, social media has been good in some sense, as it has democratised politics, it's allowed everybody to have a go, but it has also allowed this horrible toxic, nasty, bullying culture where if you don't like somebody, you can't have a civil disagreement, you have to try and silence them, you have to threaten them, you have to frighten them into silence and I think that's a very, very dangerous thing for and politics. And all of you are active on social media. Have you noticed it's got a lot worse this year? It's always been quite bad um, and I just think we've kind of gone through that now and just blocking and muting and frankly ignoring is the best approach. I think when Twitter first came about it was this wonderfully kind of like quirky thing where people put up interesting posts and everyone kind of engaged and then it became so toxic that we've now gone full circle and like the most toxic people are just the most irrelevant now and therefore one needs to kind of have I, it's terrible when people come off twitter they say well i can't cope with this i just think the more moderate and constructive the people are on twitter the less space there is for the morons who just are vile to people I who they don't a, agree with i think has a real world impact I, I think what's happening on social media is people say things on social media which they would never say to your face is the great argument mm. if you follow that through its logical conclusion the more people feel comfortable saying it on twitter mm. the more they will become yeah, comfortable yeah, saying it to your face and i i think either human beings have got worse 
or actually we've revealed something that's always been there in people. But once you've revealed that, once you've opened the gates for people to abandon all social norms, all sense of responsibility, I don't think you can ever get that back. And I think that does have a real world effect. Uh, and uh, uh, you remind me of, uh, uh, if you really are bored one day and you want to engage with your trolls, it's a remarkable thing. Someone says something highly abusive to you about whatever it is. And if you then reply to them and say, well, that's a bit unfair, a bit harsh of you, isn't it? They say, oh, I'm so sorry, I really didn't mean to offend you. <laughs> and suddenly you, you enter this like, humane, interesting conversation. God, I, don't, I don't get that with my trolls, basically. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get hours home. of your life like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't spend all my time doing it, every now and then. That's not even just me, I'm just trolling yeah, you most yeah. of the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Camilla, we come to your choice of hero now, and uh, a really positive story, this. I've just got a smile on my face just thinking about it, because I like to be transported back to the summer and watching Ben Stokes in the Cricket World Cup final, mm. and bearing in mind that he had villain status because of the brawl that he was involved in and there was even talk of him not being put in the squad and from the very beginning of the tournament that amazing catch um, which I think saw him crown player of that particular match and then of course that final over against New Zealand and everyone just being completely gripped even if you didn't watch cricket or you're one of these people who say I can't watch it because I just don't understand it you saw that raw sporting ability out there and just the psychological strength that it would have required to get through that over and um, to score two sixes I think was phenomenal. Can I say something unpatriotic? What? It was a draw. Oh, well, hang on a minute. Was there a was draw. a boundary <laughs> review. Oh, here just we go. Be quiet, it, it, it was a draw. <laughs> By any sense of sporting <laughs> fairness, it was no, a draw. No, 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 Never no. let the cricketing truth get in the way of a tremendous story. <laughs> please, please, please. Telling. And also, by the way, can we just say that if we wanted to be confirmed, this wasn't just some kind of one-off. We then saw his performance in the Ashes, where he turned that third test around. Um, I just think rightly crowned sports personality uh, of the that. year because it was just the most amazing and inspiring sporting performance that I think I've ever seen. OK, and we're going to move you on to your villain now. Yes, probably not one for cricket necessarily, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and I say um, villain, although I think fundamentally he is a decent human being and a politician, I think he's been revealed to be villainous just in the most recent days and week in the sense of him projecting himself as a different kind of politician and let's not even get into gentler and kinder politics which isn't necessarily espoused by some of his most fanatical followers but it's the sense that he was something different and yet in this clinging to power in this refusal to stand down he said not, he's going not he said he's going but i find it frankly ridiculous that he is still there you look at kinnick you look at miliband you look mm. at others who have failed before they categorically apologise, and yet Corbyn didn't even say sorry for three days to his own staffers who were left in Labour HQ wondering what was happening to their jobs. This is meant to be a champion of the workers, and I just think it's such a hypocritical contradiction that the so-called politician of the people wasn't able to admit that he was revealed to be as cravenly self-interested as the average party leader. And I think that has been the great tragedy of this. That so won much the Oh, we won the argument. Won the argument. I think it was so a draw, much... wasn't yeah, it? The that election was a draw. So, so much <laughs> hope was invested in this different kind of MP that could try and take politics to a different level. And in fact, he was just revealed to be vainglorious, arrogant and self-pitying. And I think that's a tragedy. Uh, and, and one of the things which I think members are very, very worried about is the fact that because he is staying on, Will the contest for his successor be a free and fair contest or will his hand you know, still hover over trying to sort of shape the outcome, which is again... Which is the not reason why he's staying on. But exactly, that then that's suggests, not yeah, but that suggests that's megalomania, not very fair, doesn't it? Absolutely, which again, as you say, or that's not what he, was... he thinks is best for the country. Yeah, but belief in a project that he thinks is best for the country basically explains why he lost. The ideology has been trumped by the majority collective deciding that they didn't like him or his ideas. OK, we come to you, Tom, and your hero now. Uh, a couple of heroes, in fact, three in total, uh, and they were the heroes of London Bridge. Uh, terrorist attack, uh, reasonably recently, uh, and tragically, Britain is now unfortunately used to terrorist attacks. You know, we've seen it on TV, we've seen it on smartphone versions. We know how these things play out, and we know the ghastly results. Uh, and this, uh, what happened on London Bridge as well, with uh, by the hand of Usman Khan, could have been uh, very more, very much more ghastly. 
than it was. If it wasn't for three incredibly brave people, one a chef working in Fishmongers Hall who uh, tackled Usman Khan despite the fact he was stabbed five times himself, and then two more who ran outside and tackled him uh, with, of all things, a whale's horn they managed to pull off the wall uh, and a fire extinguisher. And they disarmed him and pinned him down long enough for the police to turn up and deal with him, as we all know what happened there. But it was just true British honourable grit out of nowhere, built on bitter experience of what happens, and they saved lives. And, and, and Polish all, as well. And, and Polish, one, I was one. going to say, not all of them are British. And, and we should remember the victims, of course, as well, shouldn't we? Jack Merritt and, and Saskia Jones, Absolutely. who so sadly lost their lives in that attack. Uh, let's move on to your villains. My villains, are, again, multifold, uh, and I would certainly widen out from online trolls to say the entirety of big tech. That's an awful lot of them. So the likes of Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. And I think 2019 has been a truly awful year for them. You think of, again, another awful terror attack. Uh, Christchurch, the massacre in, in Christchurch, a, a lunatic running around with a gun. That was live streamed on Facebook. Undoubtedly a, a thing that encouraged him to do what he do because he got a thrill out of uh, live screening mass murder to the world. Facebook allowed that to happen. Online bullying on things like Instagram, but also all the fake news that's pervaded <coughs> from Twitter with no one thinking it's their responsibility to stop it simply because it harms their business model. It is utterly abhorrent, and I sincerely hope, and I also now suspect, that 2019 is the last year this is allowed to happen. 2020 is going to be the year of social media regulation. And companies like Facebook would say, of course, we don't want things like that to happen. It's just incredibly hard to, to police so much. Yes, it goes on year after year after year. And I'm, I'm afraid their answers are simply incredible. It's time for governments to step in. OK, we will leave it there. Thank you all. Uh, do stay with us, though. When we come back, our panel are going to gaze into their crystal balls to predict the stories that we'll be talking about next year. So join us after the break. Welcome back to our final part of our year in review. So having looked back at 2019, let's now look forward to 2020 and our panel's predictions for the year to come. I must say, you're all very brave. These weren't even recorded, were they? <laughs> oh, I played back to no, you. No, they weren't. Okay. Ad nauseam. No, this just disappeared just straight away. Yeah, 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 no one gets to watch it, obviously. Okay. Um, Ayesha, let's start with you. Scotland, for me. So, Boris Johnson didn't win across the whole of the United Kingdom. There was another big winner at the election, that was Nicola Sturgeon. And it's quite interesting because they are really the two kind of opposing leaders in the, the country. And she is going to square up to him definitely in 2020. And the issue of a second <coughs> referendum on Scottish independence is going to be something that she will really, really push. So she is pretty strong at the moment. However, there is a big trial coming up um, in Scotland, which is going to be a, a, a huge, huge deal. This is um, Alex Salmond, and it relates to um, sexual offences, which he denies. But it's going to be a very, very big case. And there's quite a lot of speculation about what the future might be for Nicola Sturgeon. And there's even rumours swirling around that maybe she may leave Scottish politics and maybe go off to do something in the United Nations on climate change. There's a very big climate change conference happening in Scotland next year. She's done a lot of work in this area. But whatever happens, Scotland is going to be a very, very interesting place to watch because they did not succumb to the charms of Boris Johnson. Well, yes, and what do you think, Tom? Do you think that uh, he will just hold his line, say no uh, second independence referendum? Will there be real pressure on him to change his mind? I, I think Boris Johnson is going to win this tussle, quite simply because uh, Nicola Sturgeon will shout and scream, and that's exactly what she should be doing, because she wants to ferment uh, dissatisfaction in Scotland with the Union and, and, and with England. But Boris Johnson has the legal right to say no and refuse. And as long as the polls still roughly show a reasonable majority in favour of the Union, roughly 55 45 at the moment. I think then, they have then, narrowed, they have narrowed. But not by much, there's still a majority support for the Union and as long as that continues it's got nothing to worry about. And Tom we're going to stay with you and stay with politics because your prediction involves Labour? It, it, actually, my prediction is the rise of a brand new centrist party oh. that succeeds. Oh. No, no, oh. just wait for it. No. Wait for it. Wait for it. Get out it's of good. taboo. Get out of Get taboo. Off. Taxi, taxi. So, so last year I predicted the demise of Boris Johnson. We never hear him again. So, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever, whatever values listen to me, I have no idea. Yeah. But so, hear me on this one, right? A centrist party will emerge and it will become the official opposition. And I'll tell you how. Labour are going to elect a Corbynista in the, in the shape of Jeremy Corbyn, almost certainly Rebecca Long-Bailey, in, in my view, because their membership is still substantially quite left-wing, and they don't disapprove of Jeremy Corbyn at all. So they will elect someone in Jeremy Corbyn's like. This will precipitate a mass revolt amongst all those centrist Labour MPs, still quite a few of them left, 
uh, who will, having learnt from the lessons of the last two, three, four years, they will walk, and they will walk en masse. A centrist party has failed previously because not a lot of them walked away. And here's the beauty of it all. There are 203 Labour MPs at the moment. If 102, in other words, majority of one, leave, then they will be officially crowned the official opposition, and the Labour Party will be the third party. Led by whom, whom though, Tom? Well, listen, I, I put myself on the, on the line deep enough as it is. There's yeah. actually nowhere I'm going to But a figure like, you know, Jess Phillips, Rachel Reeves, you know, a moderate Labour MP, liked, popular, who can communicate with the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting next year when we see what did happen. Yes. I won't be back to prove it either. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to bring him back. We will, of course. Uh, Steve, we come to your prediction now. Yeah, uh, I don't know how controversial this, this is. I, I think Donald Trump will lose the US election. And I think the reason why even that sounds controversial, because at one level he has, um, because he's the incumbent, there's normally a bias towards them. If the American economy is doing well, as it is at the minute, he should be well ahead. I feel he's still going to lose. I don't think impeachment matters either way. I think he, if you look at the, the midterms, he did not do well in the places that he needed to do well. Uh, if you look at his popularity rating, it is as bad as it has ever been. He only snuck through because he was uh, underestimated. He won in a couple of states. He lost the popular vote to a large extent. I still feel that America, and this is a fork in the road election. When I talked about climate change earlier, we are going to have either a president in the White House who believes that such a thing as climate change exists and will take steps to stop it, or you'll have Donald Trump who will do nothing. So this is a hugely significant moment for the world. And I think Americans, the middle class of America will eventually rise up and say, we are not going to be a laughing stock for eight years, we're going to be a laughing stock for four, and they're going to stop it now, and Donald Trump will lose, and then may refuse to leave the White House for a while. What do you all make of that? I think he will stay in office. I don't think he'll be found guilty. And I think that will allow him to kind of really stimulate his base because he can say, look, all of these opponents tried to come and get me. I always said they would. They're the establishment. This is all about draining the swamp. And I think that will make his base come out for him. And I think that means he could win the next election. I suspect it'll come down to the economy. So if the economy continues to do OK, uh, then middle of America and, and I mean places like you know Pennsylvania, Michigan, these sort of Rust Belt swing states that deliver for him first time round, they'll continue to vote for him again. In fact, I think they probably will. And I'll offer Stig fifty quid bet here and now with the winner. Come on, it was a hundred. It was a hundred. A hundred quid, two to one. Do you know you said. what? It was a hundred quid with two to one. I'm now res resiling from that because okay. you made quite a good argument. But I'll still. <laughs> I mean, 50 quid bet with the winner Hedged. paying money to help take heroes. It, take it, take it. Tragedy, 50 quid, I'll take it now. OK, Done. you heard it here. Uh, one other quick question before we move on. So who's going to win? Because we've got a big race um, Look, uh, that's for the Democrats. I, I think they might go play safe and go for, for, for sleepy Joe Biden. Um, because I, I think they'll look at... To use Donald Trump's well, Yeah, and, but I think they'll look at possibly the, the, the British election and say this is not a time to pursue left and they'll go for someone who is broadly centrist and they'll go for Joe Biden. Mm. OK, well, another interesting prediction there for us to, to pick over in a year's, in a year's time. time. Yeah, right, right. Um, and, Camilla, finally, we come to you. And, of course, um, the Olympics are coming up. Yes, which is come around very quickly uh, again. So it's in Tokyo, I know, and... Um, Actually, it's interesting that recently a survey came out which suggested that 2012 was Brit's favourite year in the last decade, and I think we all understand why that was, because of the triumph and jubilation of that competition for us. But um, we've been doing a lot to promote women's sport on The Telegraph, and I've just got into Dina Asher-Smith from reading an interview in the magazine that one of my colleagues did with her quite a long time ago, and I was just so impressed by this athlete, 24 years old, she was in Doha in the summer, smashed both of her PBs, became the world champion in the 200 metres, and I just think, and I don't want to tempt fate, but she could end up being the poster girl and the star of the Olympics, and what a brilliant thing that would be for women's sport. We've had um, a huge amount of um, very positive dialogue around women's football because of the World Cup, and I just think that if we can have our most successful female sprinter make her mark in 2020, that could be a brilliant thing that could open doors. And what a role model this lady is, not only absolutely phenomenal in her own sport and improving all the time, but really learned and considered. She got a BA degree from King's College in history. Um, she's really into um, being all-rounded. And I think schoolgirls who 
might be competing next year at Sports Day. We'll be looking up to her and putting her on a pedestal. Oh. And I hope she is physically on one. I hope she's physically on the pedestal for a gold medal. But let's wait and see. Do you know, it will make up wonderfully for England getting knocked out of yet another Euro competition and coming <laughs> yes. about 57th. Yes, so if the men are outshone by the women, that could be a great that's thing. That's fine by me. Oh, look, it would be nice if the women could get some of the pee that the men well, get in the sponsorship. Right, yeah, absolutely. That might be a debate for another day. Yeah, so and you yeah. can't underestimate the, the feel-good factor that, that wins like that could engender if if they do happen. But also, Camilla is a royal correspondent, a political correspondent, and a sports correspondent. <laughs> well, I think, no, I'm not. Is she not? Um, no, yes, yes, you are. I, mean, I think we should just be silent. Do you know what? If you've covered the royals and politics in 2019, sport has been the perfect antidote yeah, to that. That's, that's why I've been so You're focused on You're a true multitasker. Yeah, exactly. You're a media multitasker. Well, you are all multitaskers to me, and uh, oh, I really appreciate uh, all of you your contributions. Much. Thank you, Anna. Anna. Happy Christmas. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> Happy <laughs> everything. <laughs> indeed. Happy uh, New Decade. Well, indeed. Yeah. Wow. That's so true. Yeah. What do we call oh, with the 20s, obviously? <laughs> that was the not The so 10s yeah. and 20s. OK, Teens. well, we are out of time. Uh, we're, we're ending on a sunny note, I'm pleased to say, um, and we're coming to the end of Year in Review. So my thanks to Stig, Camilla, Tom and Aisha, and we'll see you all soon on the Press Preview. Yes. yes. But for now, from all of us, seasonal good wishes and goodbye.